Intel's iGPUs are often revered for being forced to run the latest games at the lowest of settings, sometimes not even the latest games. But what if, with the latest generation, there was a catch that meant you can run everything at ultra settings, just you have to run them at 480i on an old CRT TV? Now, if we're talking about modern iGPUs, that means we have to have gotten hold of a modern device. And I know what you're thinking of, that's absolutely unheard of here on Budget Builds. But thankfully, when I pitched the idea to GCOM for one of their latest mini PCs, they seemed all for it. Probably because no one has ever thought of getting a hold of a brand new device and decides the first thing we're going to test is can we run games on a CRT TV? But still, it comes with an iGPU that is one of the brand new ones from Intel, and we need to find out just how good is the gaming performance when we scale things both up and down a little bit. So the base for this experiment is going to be the GCOM GT series Mega Mini PC, which is quite the title, I'm fairly sure this is the GT1 Mega we're using today. Specifications wise, I'm not used to dealing with things that have this many varying cores, but we have an Intel Core Ultra 9 185H, which has 6 big cores, 8 small cores and 2 tiny cores, which can go up to 5.2GHz according to Intel. Generally though, from my testing, I saw it hover around 4.8GHz, which is still impressive given that was under a consistent load. But the big one here is the new Intel iGPU, the Intel Arc XE LPG which isn't a type of gas, no, that is the name of the new integrated graphics card, which will be benefiting from being able to use 32GB of rather speedy VRAM. And that's just because it's system RAM. Other than that, there isn't much else to say. We've got plenty of storage, it runs Windows 11, and from my testing, hovers around 119 watts under full load. I think they're going to be on sale for about $989, which is what I've been told, which seems reasonable enough for what is a little bit of a niche thing, as you get plenty of power tucked into a conveniently small package. I mean, the last of the mini PCs we tested on this channel was a shuttle PC, and that ran an Athlon 64 with some integrated NVIDIA chip. So this is worlds apart. With all of those specs out the way though, all we had left to do was set things up. And I don't know how many of you have gone through the Windows 11 setup screen with just a keyboard, but we have strayed so far from the realms of Windows 7 that made this ever so easy. And it feels like it takes forever to get through the Windows 11 installer, even if you've got, you know, a mouse or something, but that's besides the point. It wasn't too bad once we had things started up, and actually the new i9 in this is actually quite speedy, as getting things installed took absolutely no time at all. I was actually so impressed with how quick it was, I thought I'd actually give a quick test in my editing software and tried rendering out the last video I made, just to see how good it was, but it was very good, so off to a very nice start so far. All that was really left to do on the setup side was to get some drivers on this thing, and see just how things turned out when we had things all up to date. And the new Intel drivers seem alright, I know they've needed quite a bit of work to get them to where they are today, as from what I understand the earlier releases, they weren't great, but honestly I ran into no problems while using the latest version. They're basic and they're bare bones, in fact the Matrox cards I was using from about 20 years ago last week have more options than the new Intel displays, but they're not too bad, and across three different benchmark softwares we finally had the results we needed. These new Intel iGPUs might be the most powerful things out there, at least from an integrated Intel perspective, but they can by no means keep up with their processors, keeping in line with the theme of the Intel HD series and everything that came after that, meaning that we were going to ditch the world of high definition and return to Intel iGPU roots, namely standard definition, but not just that, no. We are going to be using my Sony Trinitron CRT, which plenty of you have seen used throughout the channel for years now, and we are going to be connecting up to the new GT1 Mini PC using a HDMI to SCART adapter. 
And I know what some of you are probably thinking, what is that horrendous looking adapter? Well, strangely enough, these things can actually pass on a really decent composite signal. Just you can't throw a straight up high definition resolution into it. it. It just doesn't work. They were never designed for that. You have to give it a proper interlay signal to deal with in the first place, which in the world of Windows 11, modern GPUs and all that, is it even possible? Well, yes, it just takes quite a while to get it right. On first boot, things wanted to load into a horrible and blurry unscaled mess, trying to scale 1080p down to 480i. And the screen, it's headache inducing, genuinely, it's, it's not nice. And unfortunately, the Intel drivers aren't cut out for this by default. Maybe there's a hidden setting in there? But all I know is, I can't even read them on this display right now. However, hidden in Windows 11, you can still enable interlaced video modes, and in there you can enable 640x480 at 59Hz displayed via interlacing, and you'll know you've got the right one as suddenly the screen becomes legible and you're actually able to read the text on there. It's not the clearest of things, I mean we're dealing with an old telly, but you can actually use and navigate Windows 11 like this. After a little while trying to configure every game to run, and don't worry, we'll be getting into that very soon, we seem to have everything all set up to run at 480i. And don't get me started on the struggle of making MSI Afterburner actually give us an overlay in 480i, let alone one that even fits on the screen. You'll see that later on in the benchmarks, you can see the frame rate in most titles but it was difficult to even get it to display properly. Datation can be sketchy in some setups, but in this possible world first, it was downright painful. But still, thanks to the GT1 Mega Mini PC, how well does Intel's new iGPU handle itself in the 480i benchmarks? Starting things off, we have a big one, with Red Dead Redemption 2 running here with ultra settings in 480i, which, may I add, is a nightmare to do. See, the game only really supports down to 1024x768 natively, which, if you think that's a 4x3 resolution, that should work, but it doesn't really work like that when you're dealing with an analogue display. However, if you load up the config file, change it to 640x480, save it as read-only while the game is running, and then go between full screen and windowed a couple of times, eventually it will display down in the correct resolution. And other than that, I can say that this game 1 looks brilliant at a low resolution, and 2, the Intel iGPU can run this maxed out at this resolution, you are talking ultra settings with all the extras on. You just have to stick to the wonderful world of 640x480i with a lot of tinkering. Next of all, I'm fairly sure I can call this a classic, it is about 11 years old, with GTA 5, which really lends itself to the CRT, given that back when this came out, some people did actually play this on one, given that the Xbox 360 and the PS3 had SCART and composite outputs and all those types of things. But still, with every option turned up as high as it would go, including the additional options, it looked brilliant and ran with a frame rate well in excess of 100 a lot of the time. Given that usually when I'm running 640x480 on an integrated graphics chip, it felt odd to be whacking up the settings to ultra rather than turning off the shadows and making it go as low as possible. The same extended over to the world of online, where you could see anywhere from 80 to 110 FPS which is a given, it's going to be lower. GPU utilisation did drop as well, but that seems to be a problem with the game itself, as once you go over lobbies that are 16 players in size, the utilisation drops and so does your frame rate. But it was nice to see that even when things got intense, it's no issue on Intel's new graphics card, as long as your old telly is also your main display. And just look at how nice it looks, this game really lends itself to the CRT. was up next, and other than the menus being a bit hard to navigate, actually supports 480i right out of the box. And yes, the speedo does take up most of your screen, but in simpler scenes and scenarios you could see well over 200 fps with the intensive ultra settings used. Not to say that it always ran this well, but at least in the most intensive of situations the game would still hover around 80 fps, which is brilliant, you're still keeping the same settings maxed out and you are still seeing well over 60 FPS a lot of the time. I'd imagine with some tweaking to the HUD, 
there's no reason why this isn't a decent way to play the game. Yes, the resolution is small, but it adds this really nice depth? I, I suppose you could call it depth? Uh, when you're going along, it, it feels so realistic, uh, which is such a dumb thing to say about a 480i image, but it looked very nice. Next up was Counter-Strike 2, which was a pain for a number of reasons. The game will eventually scale to 480i, but only after launching it with a number of changes made outside the game, and even then it does cut off a lot of the options by letting them overlap. Not that I'm saying Counter-Strike 2 has hitbox detection issues, but on the main menu when you're dealing with these resolutions it certainly does. Using high settings across the board, we saw over 200 FPS a lot of the time, even when using the benchmark tool, which really stressed things out with smokes and flames. And it wasn't even hard to play at this resolution. I'm assuming the people I was playing against were genuinely terrible at the game, because somehow I was our best player, and I was on an iGPU playing on an old TV. So you can still be competitive if this is your gaming setup. Older titles, like Fable The Lost Chapters, were designed for resolutions like this, and I don't even know if I would go as far as describing this as being like the original Xbox, which I usually do, because we had 10 times the frame rate. Where they hit 30, we hit 300, and the highest settings on the game, well, that wasn't a problem at all. It did take some fiddling, as the 16-bit colour mode would break the scaling and would cause the game to run in sort of a squashed mode, but after sorting that out and getting the game to run properly with 32-bit colours in the options menu, it was a very nice way of playing the game and looked brilliant as well. Throughout years of benchmarks, we have seen that Fallout 4 never runs well. It never maintains 60 FPS, least of all with ultra settings. Until now, the GPU utilization was all over the place, spiking from anywhere between 40 to 60 to 100% throughout most of the game. But it does stick to a constant 60 FPS, which I've never seen before. What is interesting, though, is the game's launcher detects the resolution of our desktop and sets itself to 640x480i and calls it native, which it doesn't do if you just launch the game on a standard high-definition display, revealing just how dated this game is internally. But then again, with similarities to Morrowind, which ran at this resolution on console, what's to say Fallout 4 wasn't designed in a similar way? I can honestly say, for once, this was one of the easiest games to test and launch, which has never happened before. Usually this is a nightmare to launch and get a consistent figure with, but here, with this setup, apparently this is the ideal way to play Fallout 4. which often suffers with their ultra settings being very intensive given it just chucks everything on the highest, scaled really well, albeit it did take a bit of fiddling between windowed mode and full screen until it would actually output a non-scaled image, but here with ultra settings, through both the game's built-in benchmark and our own large-scale battle benchmark, it showed no issues or slowdown. Text didn't scale very well, which was an issue with the game, as even trying to read the menus could be difficult trying to put it up to ultra settings, but with just a little bit of muscle memory, you'll be fine. Source games on the original engine also ran fine. I did test out the latest and greatest with Black Mesa here, just to get through the intro train ride, and we had no issues with the game supporting the resolution, or issues with the game running at ultra. The source engine is very scalable, so interlaced signals aren't a problem. Certainly wide open areas could cause us to drop into the mid hundreds of FPS, which would then very quickly spike back up to 200, at which point it's such a minute thing that you can hardly notice it, and I wouldn't call dropping to 100 FPS either an issue here. In terms of emulation, that is going to be a big one given this PC's form factor because you've got a very convenient little box that should be able to emulate things. And in our Wind Waker benchmark, we had the game running with all enhancements on, downsampling 5K to 480i, and yes, we are only seeing composite quality. But dare I say, this is the best I've ever seen this game look on a CRT, and that's including SCART and components. Most intensive games might need you to sort of drop down to the 4K resolution, which 
you know, I'm throwing around words like this when we're talking about an iGPU and emulation. Oh yeah, you might have to scale back from 5K down to 4K if one of the games you're running is intense. You can play these emulated games absolutely fine. But finally, can it run Crisis? Well, here in the remaster, which is a very intensive game to run, we had everything set to high, other than ray tracing, which was set to performance mode. So this is Intel's integrated graphics chip running Crisis Remastered with high settings and ray tracing. And we are pushing things nearly as far as they can go. But here in the latest iteration of Crisis, even on a graphics card that comes built into your processor, you can play the game fine and it looks absolutely stunning. It's been a long time coming, but it looks like Intel's iGPUs can finally pull off Crisis. So there we have it. The benchmarks of Intel's Arc in a possible world first with ultra settings nearly all round. And we got a couple of things out of this. Namely, Intel's new iGPU is exceptionally decent, so it's nice it's included on that PC. And two, why do so many games look good when running on a CRT? Especially Red Dead 2 and BeamNG. It almost looked like we were watching a film at times. Maybe it's the softness of the image with the high resolution details sort of crammed in there, and the perfectly fluid frame rate which looked brilliant on the CRT. It certainly was something. In terms of desktop usability, Windows 11 in 480i is a surprisingly feasible way to use your PC, outside of most applications wanting to launch in a window larger than your full display screen, especially games. You sort of had to blindly navigate around some launches, and then there are some titles that won't work at all. RimWorld, despite launching fine, well, let me say I've never seen the menus look like this. And you can't actually play the game because the buttons for it to appear don't even fit on the screen. It's trying to put them there, and it actually scales down well, there's just physically not enough space for the buttons. Fortunately, most titles actually have quite a lot of support for these resolutions. In fact, most games actually support these resolutions better than their launchers do which was especially the case in some of the GTA titles where the Rockstar launcher, you know, sort of just appears as a logo in the left-hand side of the screen, but other than that, it worked fine. That thereabout brings us to the end of this little experiment. So a big thank you to GCOM for making this video possible, as otherwise I can honestly say there is no way I was planning on getting my hands of anything that contained an Intel Arc anytime soon. And after seeing the performance of the little unit across benchmarking and some editing I was doing on it, I may have to move off my laptop soon, as this thing was genuinely very smooth to use. I'll link some 3D Mark benchmarks in the description, which show the GPU and CPU stability, but generally it was very solid. I believe there are three tiers of this mini PC coming to the market, and I imagine they all have the same rather powerful iGPU. So if you need a mini PC, or just want to dabble around with the weird form factor that these are, I'm fairly sure I've been sent some links to whack down for you below in the description, so you can take a little look at those and see if you want to get a hold of one. From my experience so far, it's a rather simple little box, it's well built, it's got plenty of I.O., it uses around 25 watts at idle, and ramps up to 120 watts under intensive load. It's quiet enough, and honestly, it's very solidly built, it's a very hardy little box. So thank you very much for watching, thanks to the guys over at GCOM for approving of the madness that is their new top of the line mini PC tested at 480i. To answer the question we all wanted to know, and we now sort of have the answers to. Thank you very much for watching, and good night.